From the Rafters of Rupp is brought to you by Bud's Gun Shop, Don Franklin's Auto Mall, Double Dogs, Friends of Cole, Hunt Brothers Pizza, Kentucky Farm Bureau, Hello everybody and welcome to this edition of From the Rafters of Rupp. I'm Kyle Macy. To have your jersey hanging from the rafters of Rupp is the ultimate when it comes to Kentucky basketball lore. The players, coaches, announcer, and equipment manager that have their jerseys hanging there have had legendary careers representing the blue and white. Throughout this series, we'll hear from members of that select group as they give you a first-hand account of why their jerseys hang from the rafters of Rupp. In this episode, I had the opportunity to sit down with Tony Delk, True Blue fans will always remember his signature double zero jersey and his uncanny ability to knock down the three-point jump shot. Tony grew up in Brownsville, Tennessee, and is the youngest of eight children. He attended Haywood High School, where he was named Tennessee's Mr. Basketball in 1992. I talked with Tony about the rigors of the recruiting process, his decision to come to the University of Kentucky, and the challenges he faced as a freshman playing in the highest level of Division I basketball. Uh, recruiting, that process started when I was a sophomore, just finishing my season. Uh, I remember receiving a few letters from some Tennessee teams, some local teams, uh, colleges that were close by, and not really knowing a whole lot about the recruiting game. So after I started playing AAU my first year, I ended up being an AAU All-American, played with this Memphis team, and we were really good. We finished that year, we finished third uh, out of all the teams at national. So that started bringing me, it started uh, giving me more exposure. Arkansas was one of the teams, uh, Memphis, close team, 30 miles from my hometown. Tennessee, they had Coach Wade Houston that was there. Um, Allen was there with Wade and another team, Men State. And then Kentucky, you know, was one of my favorites because uh, Coach Donovan started recruiting me early in the process. Uh, my mom, it's funny, she really liked Arkansas, which Coach Richardson was there and he was driving from uh, Fedville to watch me play and practice, along with Mike Anderson, who was uh, his lead assistant. And uh, those guys, like, it really came down to Arkansas, Kentucky. I mean, both teams' similarity, they had the same kind of styles. You know, it was a lot of pressing, um, shooting a lot of threes. I know there's gonna be a lot of, a lot of opportunities to score, uh, but I think Coach said something that stood out to my brothers, and that was saying, I think he, I remember him saying, I can get him to the NBA. So that's when my brother shifted from Arkansas to, you know, Coach Bettino has something that none of these other coaches come in has said, but also they've never coached on that level. Yeah, you know, this this was a this was a big city. When you come from a town of uh, about 8,000 people, and you know at some point in time you're gonna have to play in front of uh, you know, 24,000, you know, it, it's def definitely nerve wracking. Uh, but it, it was good coming in with Walter, who was my roommate that year, uh, Jared Prickett, Roger Rhodes, and you know that we had the best recruiting class in 1992. And at that time, it was so funny that um, Walter and I, you know, we we really became really good friends. Even to this day, we were really good friends. But just seeing him set out, uh, not play as a freshman, and then myself not really playing a lot of minutes as a freshman. And after about the third or fourth game, I remember going to Coach Patino. And I told him, I said, I think I want to transfer. I want to go back and maybe be closer to home. And uh, never forget, he said, well, you know, you have to finish the season. And it's hard to trust freshmen when they first come in because, you know, most freshmen don't want to play defense. Because if you're the best player in your city or in the state, you know, the coach is going to tell you you got to stay out of foul trouble. And I always consider my, my best defense is offense. But Coach Patino, I never forget saying, well, you know what, you're going to be a really good assistant coach because you're going to have a clipboard and you're going to be right next to me. You're not going to be playing on the court because you don't play defense. So I had to learn that part of it. So I think as the season progressed, uh, I started playing better one-on-one -on -one defense. And un I, then I started understanding the concept and the philosophies um, of how to play switching defense and where I need to be and also help my teammates. So he taught me that part of uh, being a really good player to, to see the ball, but also don't so much don't worry about my man so much. You know, your man, if he doesn't have the ball, you know, it's a basketball game. It's not about watching your man. 
So those are things he taught me that I became much better at by, uh, by the, end of, the end of my freshman season. Hunter Brothers Pizza has been proudly serving communities across America for over 25 years. Download the Hunt Brothers Pizza app to find one of our 7,500 locations inside a convenience store near you. Are you a sporting shooter, hunter, or looking for the best concealed carry option? Bud's Gun Shop and Range is Kentucky's largest selection of firearms, ammunition, and firearm accessories. Located on Industry Road in Lexington. After his freshman year, where he was used mostly in a reserve role, Tony's focus and confidence blossomed during the course of his intense summer workouts. He then led Kentucky in scoring during both his sophomore and junior campaigns. Tony discussed with me specific games and memories of his sophomore and junior seasons and how Coach Rick Pitino pushed him and his teammates to strive for greatness. I went to both sessions of uh, summer school and I was focused. You know, I didn't want to go back home because I knew if I went back home, I'd be hanging out with friends, not working on my game. So I went back to the lab and I stayed three or four hours a day just playing basketball. Like I fell back in love with basketball again. And that allowed me to go into my sophomore season, um, um, kind of like where I left off in high school as one of the top players in the country. That year, you know, I really, it was a special year. I really thought that, you know, if, you know, if Rodney Dent doesn't get hurt, I, I thought we'd probably go right back to the Final Four. You know, he was a huge piece coming back and playing in the Final Four like myself. We had all the right ingredients to be a Final Four National Championship team that season. And early on in that season, you know, he tears the ACL. And that is a huge setback when you have a player like Rodney Dent who would have been a lottery pick and you lose him early and we never got him back. I'm not gonna say we took him lightly. Uh, we didn't know a lot about them. You know, although, although we watched film, we knew some of the players, they didn't have a marquee player. So when the team doesn't have a marquee player, you know, you're looking at them and saying, well, okay, they're a good team, but who's the one standout? So we didn't see a standout. And even as we came out, you know, we didn't, you know, we didn't play the way our style, the way we were capable of playing, but they had a really good point guard. And he, when I say annihilated our press, he ran through, he carved our press out and we just really could never slow him down. And, uh, you know, we just, we didn't shoot the ball particularly well. And, you know, it was a game I look back of all my losses, one of those questionable losses of, you know, that was a year I think we looked past Marquette because Duke was gonna be in the next round. So, it's, you know, you never underestimate your opponent, especially in the NCAA tournament. That game, I never forget, Coach Patino came down to, I remember him calling timeout. <clears throat> and he was telling, told myself I need to transfer back to Memphis, Walter, Indiana, Roger, you need to go back to Seton Hall. He's saying, tomorrow's gonna be the worst day of you guys' life. I didn't know what practice was gonna be like. And I, I, just, I remember telling the guys, as a rally, rally the troops, I'm like, listen, we at least gotta get this thing on the team, get it respected. And we might not have practice tomorrow. I mean, it might not be as tough as we're thinking if he see us fighting hard. And we just kept playing. I mean, we got steals, we knocked down threes, we played as a team. And, you know, before we knew it, you know, we did get it to 10 and there was still a lot of time left. So once you get it under 10 points, to me, the pressure's on them. And when it got to, to around four points, I knew at some point in time, because of our work ethic, our mental toughness, that we were gonna win that game if it got within you know, the four, four to two point range. His style allowed us to make runs, crazy runs, but also come back in games where you know, you're thinking the game might be over. But the style is what everyone enjoyed watching the numbers, the 80s, the 90s, the 100 point that we could put on the board. And I mean, I loved it. And the guys knew that you know, if we played together, everybody was gonna get shots. It wasn't gonna be, we always gonna get steals and layups and so nobody during my time we didn't worry about shots but he he taught us how you know mentally physically to be in the best possible shape if you're going to play this game and that's something I, that's a testament to him also you know not only preaching it but also he would you know, he did the same thing he would be up at five or six in the morning playing one-on-one -on -one, uh, playing five on five with his coaches uh, running on the treadmill so as a coach uh, he set the example, but he demanded it from us. You never want to lose because he has a, he has a winning attitude, and he made losing seem like this is the worst possible thing that could happen to you. And that's how we felt. We never want to lose games. 
All right, Corey Beck, uh, Clem McDaniels, they had Alex Dillard, of course, Scotty Thurman, uh, Cordis Williams. That team, that team was, was really good. And plus, that was their, their championship returning team, you know, from 94. We were behind with like about eight points with maybe a minute and 20 or 30 seconds, you know. And, and it, was, it was a game where you look up at the scoreboard, they played the same style, so really we couldn't press them. You know, but we made a couple key steals, made some big shots, and ended up forcing the game in overtime. I'll never forget uh, Roger Groves got fouled, and I remember him telling uh, telling Arkansas the game is over. He goes and missed both missed both free throws. Game going overtime, and you know uh, Anthony Elves had to consult him on the sideline. He was, you know, mentally he had checked out. He was done. But we ended up winning that game, um, and, and like I said, just. We had so much confidence, you know, we had played well all the way up until that point, and we knew Arkansas was going to be a tough game. You know, we lost to them my first three years every regular season, we beat them every tournament, so it was our time to beat them. We'll be right back after a word from our sponsors. Kentucky Farm Bureau Insurance, big on commitment. We never set out to be the largest auto dealer in Kentucky. He just set out to provide people reliable vehicles and great customer service. And for the last 50 years, that's what we've done. The 1995-96 Kentucky basketball season proved to be a special one indeed. Senior leadership from Walter McCarty, Mark Pope, and Tony helped the Wildcats set their sights on college basketball's ultimate prize. Tony shares with us how that season unfolded and how the Cats made their magical run to the NCAA championship. We brought in Wayne Turner, another really good heralded guard, um, McDonald's All-American that was really good at that position that could break down the defense. But Ron was that, that three that we needed. Um, Mid-range shooter, great size, and Nazi was young. You know, Nazi was a typical freshman, still trying to learn the game and where he fit in at. And it was kind of the speed of the game from high school to college. And that it you know, it takes takes guys a few months before they adapt. And Nazi was kinda like the guy you know, who's still trying to get in shape. And you know, it was it we had grueling practices. And for a freshman that was kinda overweight, it was hard for Nazi, you know, and the best thing to have for Nazi was Coach Patino. You know, he would run with him, he would get him in great shape. But then going back to Ron, you know, he was a mid range specialist. Uh, great player in the open court, and you know, once again, you bring Wayne in, he can break anyone down off the defense. Antoine was a versatile big. Walter and I were seniors, along with Mark Pope. Um, you know, guys that he can rely on. You know, so when you become a junior senior, coaches trust us. We've been in the style, we know his system, we know what he expects out of us. So he allowed us to play uh, my senior year, and you know, he was more of a more of a fan. You know, he still coached, but. He became a fan because he knew we were going to go out there and execute. But Anthony Epps, he was the engine. You know, he was the IQ that we needed to, to manage and massage the players at every position and know how to get the ball to the right guys. And Wayne, coming out of high school, he was a big-time scorer. So it, it actually made Wayne a better player to see how to be a facilitator at that position surrounded by good talent. We stayed number two all year. So as we lost that game being number one, we lose it to UMass, they stay number one all year. We're number two, so it's not as much pressure when you're number two. Everybody wants to be number one. Number two, you don't get the same kind of uh, you know, so, you know, support from the media or it's, it's not as exciting to crash the floor, but uh, to run out on the floor. But that year it was really good because you know just being number two, you know, we just really stayed in our lane. We was happy with it. We knew at some point in time we'll get a chance to, you know, we knew we was going to go to Final Four that year. You know, we didn't go in, we didn't take this team like, I mean, Dante Jones got hot. I mean, and when one player get hot during an NCAA tournament or SEC tournament game, one player can win a game. And we just really didn't have that one player that uh, that could shut him down. So he was the player that really hurt us the most. And it was a, everyone said it was a good loss. Uh, we needed that loss before we went into the NCAA tournament, but we didn't go in trying to lose. And I remember Antoine and Coach kind of getting into it during the second half, and he benched in the second half. So it was a statement to him that, you know, uh, you, you're not bigger than a team, but also, you know, we knew how good we were. 
Uh, we double teamed him big on big. So you have 6'10", 6'10", Walter and Antoine, two active, long, athletic bigs. And it made it hard for him to see out of, out of the double team. And he struggled, you know. And like I said, we had really good guards on the weak side that were able to read passes. And so we really just focused on him, which Coach Patino was really great at taking the team best player out. If you got you, you would have to have two or three other guys to complement that really good player, and we we saw they didn't have that, so we took it away from him. And you know when you can do that, now other guys got to step up, and we were able to guard those guys one on one. I wasn't satisfied just getting to the final four, and I think a lot of teams who haven't gone and players who haven't gone, they're just happy to be there. You know my mindset was I want to win, I want to be a part of history because I remember as we started that season. Coach was telling us, he said, we have a lot of great scores. He said, but you're going to have to sacrifice something in order to be a part of history. I think we played them two or three times before. We played them uh, our 96 year early on, and we lost to them uh, in Detroit. But this team was solid. They had two really good backcourt players, Trevor Aso. Uh, he was really good and solid as far as like making decisions, knocking down shots. And, um, you know, we knew Marcus Camby was going to be a low. You know, they would have to throw the ball to him. And we were just hoping that our strategy that we did against Tim Duncan was also going to work against him and make him turn the ball over. Um, but as far as pressing them, we knew it was going to be, you know, they, they were ready for our press. You know, we knew there was a guard that could play 40-plus minutes if needed. Because he was, like you said, he, he was strong mentally. And uh, he was in really good shape. And that, that team was confident because guess what? They beat us early. But we knew that if we played our game, knocked down shots, guarded, that we were the better team. Playing against Syracuse was, uh, it was different because, you know, we really hadn't doing that year because we had so many good shooters. We never really saw a zone and that was their primary defense. So we knew we was gonna see it. And it was about taking good shots, rebounding out of the zone, um, getting easy to look for the shooter. And you know, we was hoping that we could just wear them down. But to me, it was, of all the games we played, it was our worst game. We missed so many shots. I, I missed a couple of layups, we missed a couple of shots down. We could have easily been up 10 points the first half. And I don't know if it was the nerves, uh, but we missed a lot of chippers. It, it was a team that wouldn't go away. I mean, it was one of those teams you look and say, they're not as talented, they only have one player that's gonna be a pro. We have all these pros, why they're still in the game? But team that was well coached. Um, their zone worked in their favor the second half because again, you know, you don't see a lot of zones. It's not gonna be a coach's best defense. But with Coach Bayham, it's always been his best defense. But once you get to that point as a senior, you know, you want to leave as, as a winner. Um, and, you know, like I said, Walter, uh, Mark, you know, those, you know we, we all paid our dues, you know, and it was our opportunity to not only get there, but now we're in position to win. So your game plan has to change, but also your mindset. There is no greater feeling. I mean, just to know that, you know, coming in as a freshman, not playing, possibly wanted to transfer, uh, seeing players come and go, having played so many games, the tradition here at Kentucky to see the banners, you know, even a person like you, jersey hanging up, uh, you know, it, it was a great feeling, you know, to, to, to come back from the Meadowlands, you know, being crowned national champion. And it started as, you know, as a freshman and ended as a senior and just playing for Coach Bettino. It was kind of like our gift back to what he gave to us. Coal Industries had a big impact on my life. My grandfather was a coal miner, my father was a coal miner. Coal is the largest driving force in our local economy. That's why I'm a friend of coal. Double Dogs is a great place to eat. In a single word, delicious. At the conclusion of his senior year, Tony was named a consensus first team All-American. He was also named the SEC Player of the Year as well as the NCAA Final Four's Most Outstanding Player. But more importantly to Tony, the win over Syracuse captured the Wildcats' sixth NCAA title. Nicknamed the Untouchables, Tony recalls the closeness of that team and what it meant for them to have the overwhelming support of the Big Blue Nation.
It means there was a bunch of guys that sacrificed. We committed on both sides of the ball. We loved playing with each other. Um, we enjoyed the game, and we loved the game. And just playing for Coach Patino and being named the Untouchables mean we felt that it was a team that was special because of our winning streak, how bad we beat opponents, but how we, how much fun we had. We had a lot of fun. We enjoyed it. You know, it's funny when you come here and you have, you have uh, no points, no rebounds, no assists, don't have any steals. Is you never, you don't know how your career is going to end, and you don't know what kind of stats you're going to put up, or if you're ever going to be a guy that will be inducted to the Hall of Fame, have your jersey retire, win a championship, go to Final Four. You don't know any of those things. You know, you just come in and you're a freshman, and you're just playing basketball. So as my, you know, as my career as an NBA player, uh, coaching, doing stuff for ESPN, I look, I reflect on my career, and I always think about what if I had a left Kentucky? None of those stats, they would be available. No one knows where Tony Duck is. Uh, so it, it means a lot just to have laced up and played uh, at Rupp Arena and played against so many great teams. but. Just the tradition uh, itself speaks value for anyone who comes and puts on that blue jersey, plays in front of 24,000 fans, have the state of Kentucky embrace them. Uh, being from Tennessee, you know, this is like my home away from home. So to have won a championship uh, here in Kentucky, you know, it's one of my greatest highlights, uh, definitely one of my greatest highlights as a basketball player. Tony was selected in the first round of the 1996 NBA draft by the Charlotte Hornets. He enjoyed a successful 10-year professional career, including stints in Sacramento, Phoenix, Boston, and Atlanta. Tony Delk ended his career at Kentucky fifth on the all-time scoring list with 1,890 points. He still holds a career mark at Kentucky for 283 three-point baskets, and his 247 total points scored also ranks first on Kentucky's all-time NCAA tournament scoring list. An NCAA championship? Numerous individual awards and accomplishments will remain in the minds of the Kentucky faithful each time they visit Rupp Arena and see Tony Delk's double zero jersey hanging from the rafters of Rupp. Thanks for joining us, everybody. Until next time when we will hear more tales from the rafters of Rupp. From the rafters of Rupp was brought to you by Bud's Gun Shop, Don Franklin's Auto Mall, Devil Dogs, Friends of Cole, Hunt Brothers Pizza, Kentucky Farm Bureau, and by Rafferty's.